I'll take Cthulhu over you devils any day. And Sade. Can I just go second from now on? Because David always has a nice good quote, and I'm just like, I was going to say something, and now I forgot. <laughs> so, but I'm here, and I'm ready for this. Yeah, I can do your you first <laughs> next time. Uh, yeah, uh, we just finished reading The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval. Holy shit, it's really good. (laughs) I'm going to say that right off the bat. Holy shit, it's really good. Further proof in my mind that other people write Lovecraft better than Lovecraft. Uh, I'll I'll provide the summary. Um, uh, It is based off the horror um, at Red Hook by uh, H.P. Lovecraft. I blanked on his name first. That's fine. (laughs) Uh, The story is actually from... Uh, well, the first half of it is from the point of view of uh, Tommy Tester, who is a black man living in 1925 New York, uh, specifically Harlem. And one of the things he does is he, I don't want to say he swindles people, but he kind of does. Like, he takes odd jobs that pay him a lot of money. It begins with him actually getting giving a book to a woman and... It's supposedly a special type of magical book, but he's ripped out the page that would make the difference in terms of casting spells or creating magic. One of the things he also does is he pretends to be a musician when really he can only be play a few songs. And he is approached by uh, Sui Dam uh, from the original novel, or short stories specifically, and is asked, I want you to play at my party. And I will pay you this large amount of money. Uh, He's approached by two cops, um, both very racist and one of them much more of a jerk than the other. Detective Howard, ironically enough. And the other (laughs) is uh, Thomas Malone, who is also from the original short story. Eventually, Tommy Tester does go to Sui Dom's house and uh, learns that Sui Dom is planning to awaken the sleeping queen king and this leads tommy tester to learn that there is some things outside of the realm that he that are actually real and he gets involved with trying to bring back the sleeping king uh the second half is from thomas malone's point of view and he is witnessing how this is coming to fruition and the climactic ending leads with uh, Tommy Tester, now known as Black Tom, basically killing Sui Dam and uh, summoning, which is, it's basically Cthulhu. And, he summons Cthulhu. Yeah. Uh, there is, there's other important points, and I know we're going to get into that later. This is just a summary. Yeah. And it ends with uh, basically Tommy Tester apparently disappearing, never heard from, and... Uh, Thomas Malone trying to live his life, trying to uh, figure out if what he saw was real, while others are saying, no, that's not possible. It is not possible that a black man could have done all of this. It clearly was just Sui Dom. And then ends with him seeing Cthulhu's eyes in the sky. (laughs) So, uh, again, there's a lot more to this story, and uh, more than I could say in the summary, but that's just the basic details so um how do we begin uh by all of us gushing over how much we enjoyed it and how fucking beautiful kevin r free's voice (laughs) yes (laughs) i actually re-listened to the entire uh audiobook over last night and finished it off again this morning Mm -hmm. um just really enjoying 
that man's voice and just like the variation and like depth he gave to each character with his voice like he like really added a whole other layer to the story so if you like are listening to this and read the story i definitely still recommend the audiobook because that is also an experience of its own fun fact um if for anyone who listens to welcome to night vale this is narrated by the same person who plays kevin on uh, desert mm. bluffs radio so yes and fuck i loved kevin so much i re-listened to it and the way that he does some of the characters voices are just amazing i cannot stop laughing when he was doing that white woman's voice it was oh my god it's so good <laughs> just the fucking the white lady in, in uh, Flatbush? Yeah, she's like... Yeah, well, the one who witnessed. Yeah, I was worried for my kids! <laughs> <laughs> Fucking just... Uh, holy shit. Okay, actually, I know where I, where we can start. And, and it's something that we actually should address. Because the reason we chose uh, to read The Ballad of Black Tom is because it was written... It's written by a black author. Um, and it does wonderfully... Um, of bringing uh, the racial issues, especially ones that were prevalent in the 1920s and are still very much prevalent now, into this story, and that added a lot of death. And for me, the horrifying shit was obviously not, like, the eldritch wonderfulness that we all love, Mm -hmm. but just the fucking details where we see the racism from... From uh, Malone and Howard, and from the fucking white lady who's like, oh, well, I was watching this black man because, well, I have children. And just, like, sorry, I hit my table. No, no, that's that's that's, that's a totally justified reaction, too. <laughs> oh, I mean, like, it's, the book's got lines like, I feared for my life. I unloaded my revolver, and then I reloaded and fired again. Yeah, the the scary part is, um, so one of the biggest scenes in there is when Tommy Tester comes back to his house and discovers that uh, Detective Howard killed his father just because he they were entering his apartment under speculation. There, there's really no reason why they should have entered his apartment. And they just saw a man holding a case, and it was a guitar case, and he's like, well, I feared for my life, so... I shot him, reloaded my gun, and shot him the whole, those ring. It, it, it's so baffling. And actually, at the time when I first heard this, or on the audiobook, this was around the same time that everything with George Floyd came up, and it's just a weird parallel. Everything with the protest and George Floyd and everyone else who the protests are for and just a, the police brutality, I mean, that was that sparked why we've decided to go with black authors. So that was already going. Well, for me, it was read that first listen. Cause, okay, I listened instead of I read it. Listen, just fucking listen. It was good. That first listen was incredibly disturbing and uncomfortable because of those parallels, specifically with that where um, Howard kills Thomas's uh, father. Because fucking Thomas's father was in bed with the guitar, completely, like, just living his life and this cop comes in and shoots him in his own bed and we have a fucking parallel to that right now with Breonna Taylor's case. Right. Mm-hmm. So just like, I was like, fuck. That hit hard. Oh, it's, oh God, it's, it is it is a weird book to read at the time when mm-hmm. this is all going on. I think it's a very good book to read right it's now. It's especially oh, absolutely. important because, like, this is supposed to be happening in 1925, and it just goes to show. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, it's 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 fiction to a degree, but it's fiction grounded in a, in a reality that is witnessed from this person, and and things really haven't changed when you think about it. Mm-hmm. There were moments where it was like, is this in 1920s or is this taking place today? Because I could see this shit today. I mm-hmm. think the difference now is. We now have people rioting. We now have people saying, fuck this, we have to do something. Well, I, the reason that I, I want to make sure we hit this first is because we, yes, we, we really enjoyed the book, really enjoyed the fantastical endless storytelling, the characters, but we, we want to, I guess, get address that first. There are parallels in this book with real day issues and... That definitely adds to the impactfulness of the narrative and what fuels. It makes what fuels uh, Tommy Tester's character 
very real and i think that's where a lot of this the the power and just the real horror of right. the, the narrative comes from absolutely absolutely so, um let's just get that down I, i'm going to start right now saying because uh one of the things i also did was i wanted to know why did um a black author decide to take on a story like the horror at red hook which both Dave and I read it. I'm not sure if you did, Sade. I did not. That's it's audit- probably for the best because uh, earlier on, uh, if I may, if I may, real quick here, earlier in this, like the first episode we ever did of Darkly Lit was talking about at the Mountains of Madness because we were like, okay, let's mm-hmm. let's let's read Lovecraft. And I, while Lovecraft has good ideas in terms of the cosmic universes he's building, I am not still not a fan of his writing and. Red Hook was even more of a slog to get through than even at the Mountains of Madness, because not only did it have to wade through his prose, but also his racist assertions about people, about the the, the character and evil nature of oh, no. foreigners it, and it, swarthy awful. people living in Red Hook. And I'm like, and you know, and here we have we have Victor Laval's story, you know, written from an entirely different perspective, running basically playing jazz riffs over the original red hook story and mm-hmm. the language is more grounded it's more easy to follow and it's and it's more visceral it, it's it's real it's more real Look. and because of that i i f- fully assert that i think most people who write lovecraft do write it better than lovecraft himself write his stuff better than he I wrote agree. his stuff so i agree um, and i don't care who who hears that and thinks well i'm like no don't you don't understand his, I just, I can't, I can't get behind, even the stuff that's not racist, I can't get behind his prose. It's just too, I get too bogged down. This, this is, this was so good. <laughs> so I'm going to, I would like to provide some history here too. Um, so here's a quote from H.P. Lovecraft about the horror at Red Hook. Just, just to clarify that there's no question here. He said, the idea that black magic exists in secret today or that hellish antique rites still exist in the obscurity is one that I have used and shall use again. When you see my new tale, The Horror at Red Hook, you'll see what use I make of the idea in connection with gangs of, uh, of young loafers uh, and of herds of evil-looking foreigners that one sees everywhere in New York. Yeah, there, there's no doubt about it. He is very uncomfortable about that. Or he... He, he is he racist. Was, he was racist. Yeah, that that's. Um, but then I read interview an interview by Victor Laval. Um, he was uh, interviewed on NPR, and he actually cited H.P. Lovecraft as one of his four fundamental writers that inspired his own writing. And I thought this was fascinating because, again, how, why, um, and. Here is what he said. He said he started reading this when he was 10 or 11 years old, and I'm going to quote him here. Lovecraft in his own life felt incredibly powerless. He was from a family that once had wealth but had lost it all. He was raised in a very cloying family atmosphere, and then his mother died. His father was institutionalized, and then he was essentially left alone, left to his own devices. And in so many ways, even though he was this incredibly smart and well-read human being, he was also this in many ways, this flailing 10 or 11 year old kid. And the compliment that you can pay to his art is that he actually got that down on the page in a way that this 10 or 11 year old black kid from Queens could also relate to. So, Mm. and Victor Laval pointed that out. Like when he was 10 or 11, he constantly had to answer to some sort of authority figure, his mom, his aunt, his teachers, whatever. So he felt he didn't have much control of his life and he could relate to Lovecraft in that way that there is a lack of control in his life. And that's part of the whole idea of cosmic horror. Uh, But Mm. another thing is he did admit that it wasn't until he was much older that he realized, oh my God, H.P. Lovecraft really is a racist individual. And that was very conflicting for him. He's like, like Victor LaValle read all of his works already and he loved them. Again, one of his four fundamental writers so he wrote this book kind of as a response to that. And another thing that he pointed out was Lovecraft was getting down on page. A great deal was his fear of everything. Everything. He feared women. He feared anyone who wasn't white. He feared Jewish people. I wouldn't be surprised if he feared like cards as well. 
like he was just so afraid of the modern world. And he managed to, rather than making it a one-for-one one, and just having those groups of people who he feared and hated show up in his the books and stories as people acting terribly, he came up with these strange and impossible creatures because really, on some level, he was almost trying to capture the depth and breadth of his terror. And I don't think that excuses H.P. Lovecraft's racism at all. What it does is it defines him as basically being xenophobic. Oh, absolutely. Like, this, that's the, the definition of xenophobic. Like, when, but with heavy emphasis on the phobic. Mm-hmm. And it is true. He was afraid of everything. Uh, there, when he married Sonia Green, he moved to New York with her, but he absolutely hated the city. Like, he would actually move to the middle of the street if mm-hmm. he saw uh, someone of a different color or a foreigner or anything just to avoid them on the sidewalk and Sony Green uh his wife thought that was so strange he's like he really was afraid and even there's a point in the short story the whore at Red Hook it begins by saying Thomas Malone was afraid of buildings I'm like wait he's afraid of buildings (laughs) what because of this one event because it happened in a building which I find ridiculous but yeah, I think you that's what it is. He's afraid of everything. And one of the things Victor Laval says is like I disagreed with his view of New York and he wanted to show how wonderful it can be rather than the slum that H.P. Lovecraft does show it in this. Mm-hmm. I think when when we compare the the two, obviously Lovecraft was writing from a point of view that was fear where he he didn't understand the things that he was looking at, so he just, I don't understand it, I'm afraid of it, and that is natural human instinct. What I love about Lavelle taking it is that he gave us the perspective that Lovecraft never was going to have. Because we got to see a lot of what those slums that Lovecraft thought was there from the first part of the book, where we're, we're seeing what Thomas Live... Tommy's life, and when he goes to the, was it the Victoria Society or something? Yeah, the Victorian Society. Yeah, you know. And and yeah, there's, we hear a little bit of, like, you know, there's um, people making, like, uh, illegal alcohol and, like, whatever, what, it's not all great. But there's also, like, I don't know, there's, like, a charm to it that it's it's just how life is for, I don't know, okay, I'm not, what, what I wanted to really talk about when you were bringing all that up was uh, Lavelle was talking about how he just really pulled from Lovecraft's writing. It was a great inspiration. And then to discover, oh fuck, he's racist. How And like, just not knowing how to feel about that. I, I actually been having a conversation with different friends about that where you, they say, don't ever meet your heroes. Um, and discovering that someone is not who you thought they were. And what I was trying to tell my friends, and I think this is what Lavelle did when it came to Lovecraft and his writing, uh, is he, he took the things that he learned from his writing, all the good things, all the good feelings, and he made it his own. Mm-hmm. And that's what you need to do when you discover that something or someone that you've looked up to is actually complete garbage and a shit person. It's, it's a way to kind of separate the art from the artist to a degree. Yeah, I don't think you should completely abandon, like, because you've had good feelings, you had good experiences. I don't think you should completely abandon that. I think you take what you can learn and make something better with it. You know, pick up where they failed if you can. And I I think Lavelle did that exactly with this because I think this is a fucking great story. And I <laughs> love the idea that Lovecraft would be rolling in his grave. <laughs> um, I will say one thing about the horror at Red Hook. Because for the most part, it's not that great. But there is... <laughs> it's not. But there is one part that's really fascinating. And... Just letting you know, this is before he fully delved into cosmic horror. This was before he went full, like, Cthulhu and all that. There's this description where Malone sees a, uh, this, like, creature, this phosphorant creature, and, um, she, I think it's supposed to be Lilith, like, from the Bible, and it's, like, a demonic creature, and there's, like, a black sea 
and uh, Sui Dam is a corpse, and he's coming back, and he has to race Lilith to get to this golden pendant. It's a very well-described, very horrifying kind of scene, and I feel like that's his strength. His strength has always been coming up with strange and unusual creatures yeah. and descriptions about how that happened. Yeah. It's that part that makes that a lot of people remember him by. It's those kinds of details that people like to talk about. I, it's interesting because I feel like that's what... The Ballad of Black Tom, because it, it does have those descriptions, but the whole story is good. It's like, <laughs> I, it's almost like, I do remember like the whole, when he's describing like taking Tommy Malone's blood and like summoning, trying to summon Cthulhu, but it's... Well, like, I, I love the, even the really subtle stuff at the beginning, like where when he first goes to Queens and gives the copy of the Supreme Alphabet to Ma'at, and we already get, a, the, the, the moment the book had me personally, like I was really into it, but the moment it really sunk in was when... They talked about what this little yellow book was, and they were kind of hinting at that there was some sort of art, something deep and arcane involved. And I'm like, I live for this sort of shit, like this kind of urban fantasy, this like this idea that magic and ritual exist in a modern setting. In this case, this would be mm -hmm. a modern setting in 1925, but it's and only a few people know about it, but it's all played very straight and very low key. And I like that Tommy Tester as a character knows about this kind of stuff and he knows enough to deal with it, mm -hmm. but he treats it like a normal job. And and then and it sets up a lot of good stuff with like the mystery of who Ma'at is and like what is the Supreme Alphabet? What is the little yellow book? Like that, I think what Laval is doing is I think he actually helped establish a wider universe than Lovecraft ever did in the horror at Red Hook. And I realize it's from his earlier work, but the fact that Laval takes this, the, the framework, the, the basic framework of the story, does his own spin on it, um, changes a lot of it pretty completely, but manages to make it more Lovecraftian in terms of what it's trying to evoke than what Lovecraft did. Mm -hmm. I mean, because this, the other one didn't involve the, you know, the Cthulhu mythos at all. This one involves it in a really good way. It, it improves on things that were maybe kind of left by the wayside in, in Red Hook. I mean, Robert Suidam is a more significant character in this story oh, yeah. than he was in the horror at Red Hook. Even Malone is a more significant character in his own way than he was in Red Hook. And that's saying something. <laughs> like, there's actually an explanation for... I like how at the end of, of The Ballad of Black Tom, we see that same scene that was at the beginning of the horror at Red Hook where Malone is in that little town in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and he looks up at the tallest building, falls to the ground, and starts screaming. And in this one, it's just, in the other one, it's like, oh, he has a fear of tall buildings. Here it's like, no, he looked up and he saw fucking Cthulhu in the sky. And that was what caused him to freak out. And I like that we, we get that same scene, but now there's a depth to it that wasn't in the horror at Red Hook. But more importantly, I think Tommy Tester is a just better character to follow, and the dilemma is better. And, the, and like you started to say earlier, Kayla, and, and, and you as well say, the, the real horror of this is, like the Cthulhu, the, the Cthulhu mythos, the cosmic horror, is lampshaded, is, is less gut-punching and less horrific than what mm -hmm. happens to Tom every day. All the, like, the microaggressions and the overt aggressions and the murder of his father escalating because of his race. Mm -hmm. Because of the society he has to live in. That horror is made well evident in the story and i don't think it's downplayed but it's not overplayed it's like just by it being there to me it just makes my stomach churn mm -hmm. i think it definitely propels cosmic horror that is in the story too because we get to like the end and malone's like why are you doing this and he's like my father's name was charles tester and my mother was irene tester and you're like fuck me yeah. and you and for me personally i was i was like yeah just fuck everything man yeah. go you do you do what you got to do black tom exactly I, again i think what makes the difference is him saying i'd rather take on cthulhu than you motherfuckers any day <laughs> Like that says everything. Like why he's doing this. I will why... choose. I will choose cosmic indifference over the constant bullshit. Bullshit. 
the constant nonsense, absolute inhumanity I have to deal with every single day. <laughs> I, I think another great part, by the way, as well as you know, say David has a thing with eyes. Oh God! <laughs> oh yeah, I want to get to when the you, fucking. I, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I had to. I had to squinch my way through that because, like, my God, it's more just the fact that, like, everything after that with Malone getting his eyelids cut off. All I could think of was like, see, this is how you do Jeff the Killer, right? <laughs> The but fact, also, it was really gross. But, and, but and the it, reason he does it is so great. He's like, now you don't ever have to shut your eyes to this anymore, or you don't. You're not allowed to look a blind eye to it. I forget what the word yeah. is, but it's so good. It's it's got a deeper meaning than just I'm forcing you to look at Cthulhu waking up through this portal. Yeah, because Malone's character, yes, he was definitely racist in that he had his opinions as well. But he was also a little more on the line of like, well, I'm gonna ignore it, you mm-hmm. know. Like, he, he he wasn't as horrible, but he was still just as horrible because he didn't act on things. And so that line right there is, like, you don't get to choose to be blind when it's convenient for you. Also, really fucking hit home right now. Because, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. like, lots of fucking people just being goddamn selfish and would rather, you know, ignore the problems and the issues than inconvenience themselves. And... Okay. I think, Can no, I, I think... This book, what we're saying, everybody, is this book is really fucking relevant. This is a very good read it's right now. It's a really, now. really good read right now. <laughs> and you pro- hopefully you all read it with us. A really good read anytime, but right now, definitely connect and mm-hmm. hit me on the roof. Okay, yeah. The reason I appreciate that his character is in this book and the way he is portrayed is because he's like a normal person but because he chooses the actions he does, he still comes out as a bad person who still is seen as racist. And mm. you rarely get to see that in early media, or even just media now, whenever they address race uh, relation issues. A person can listen to Detective Power and be like, oh, well, at least I'm glad I'm not like him. But it's kind of hard. I know it's probably hard for some people like, well, I am kind of like Thomas Malone in that way though and because if you think about like any of the movies Malone Malone keeps talking about how sensitive he is how he understands things that other people don't and he really doesn't he knows he knows he knows about the cosmic shit he knows about the arcane shit because he looks into it but he still doesn't know a damn thing what I'm saying is like look at past movies I guess about like uh about racism like that usually directed by a white person Mm -hmm. and the racist people are usually the overtly racist people and as a result white people will say like well at least i'm not like them so guess i'm fine that's not the case here here like thomas malone is a normal person but like you said he says he's sensitive he he doesn't outrightly say like uh terrible things but he still ignores the situation he doesn't do anything to progress it it's the, his actions still come across as racist. Mm-hmm. In, in this instance, between Howard and Malone, we're shown two different ways of being racist. And one is more blatant, and one is a little more discreet, but it's still there and still an issue. Exactly. I think we've said a lot of what needs to be said. Um, I mean, salient points I will pick up, pick, I already said. I think I think Stewie Dom is a fantastic character in this one. Yes, I really enjoyed him. Also because... Kevin Arfrey gave him this voice that is a little closer to the Kevin from Night Vale, and I just fucking love that voice. <laughs> Sorry. No, my... Just like that, like, kind of, like, stuck up, like, snobby, like, almost like, like, cadence, and just, I'm like, I'm here for it. The Sorry. The sleeping I king. love the snobby villains. <laughs> oh, and, 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 and my other favorite Kevin Arfrey voice was Buckeye. I like that he gave him kind of a Caribbean Yes. Accent. Yes. Yeah. I, what, I think my favorite um, way that he said his line was, like, he won't mess with Black Tom. Who the hell is Black Tom? Yeah, he was definitely still, like, you know, like, the friend. Like, he was his friend, and, like, you could still, like, in, in those conversations, you could, like, feel the depth of their friendship. Yeah. And, like, Buckeye trying to understand and being like, okay, well, we're gonna get rid of this murder weapon, and I'm gonna stop calling yourself Black Tom, because that's weird. Also, I want to go to the Victorian Society and have some of that, like, what was it, papaya juice? Uh, like, yeah. I want some of the Puerto Rican food. Like, fuck, that sounded Everything so about the Victoria Society sounded amazing. Anyway. One of my favorite little tiny scenes that I wanted to mention earlier when David brought up when they first introduced the book uh, was the 
how Tommy was like, I didn't touch it. I didn't read it. I took out that last page because otherwise they were going to be able to do shit with it. But the whole part of, like, that his father took out the last page because his father can't read. And the line, it was something like, you don't break the rules, but you can skirt them somehow. Like, something yeah, like yeah. I was like, I love that. Like, yes. It's really anyway. fucking good. Question, Question. Question time. Uh, so, Bringer asked a lot. Um, I had to uh, choose some. Um, one of them was, uh, how did changing the character from white to black affect the way the story is told? I think we... Basic. I think we definitely hit that on that. Uh, yeah. Why did Tom betray Sui Dam? Wasn't their goals the same? The key reason for that is because Sui Dam is doing what every other person in Tom's life was doing, trying to assume authority. Assume authority, take power. So one of the things Sui Dam tries to do, and this actually is in Black Book, he says, "We're I'm gathering all uh, foreigners and people of color together, and I'm going to try and make a new world for us. But it would be with him as the ruler. Mm-hmm. And Black and Tom's not on board for that. Black Tom was like, no, fuck everybody. Nobody gets anybody. Anything. Yeah, if you're gonna do if you're gonna do cosmic indifference, you gotta do cosmic indifference, right? And what I think I appreciate is Tom, we never know what happens after he goes through that door or how how mm-hmm. he gains the powers, how he becomes basically Cthulhu's acolyte to a degree. Yep. But he knows that Cthulhu doesn't give a shit about anybody. Mm-hmm. He's just like, I just want the indifference. I just want this to end. I No one should be in charge. This just needs to end. Mm-hmm. What I like about that is that twice we had a moment where Tom goes through, starts to go through those doors, those library doors. First time he, well, he, he ends up seeing Malone. But, like, both times, Sui Dom is like, no, 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 we can't open those doors. Like, we'll just, that's, that's bad shit. And the first time it's an accident and we can just learn about it and he's like, we got lucky. That could, shit could have happened. We could have fucking ruined everything, but we just got lucky. Okay, cool. And then later, after the death, after Tom's father dies, is fucking murdered, and Tom is, is listening to this man, he's hearing his speech again, and he's like, yo, fuck this. I don't fucking give a shit anymore. <laughs> and he just goes through the doors. He doesn't. I, he doesn't go through those doors with any intent of of getting any kind of power, of maybe even surviving. He's just like, I don't fucking give a shit anymore. And he reached a mindset that Suidam was never gonna get because he was after power. Suidam was doing it for selfish reasons. Yeah, and you can you can tell Suidam doesn't care because one of the things he says when uh, Tommy enters the doors is. Not yet, you dumb ape, which is a offensive term to use mm-hmm. for um, for black people. So that's when you know. That's when you know he doesn't care about them. He just wants power. That's all it is. He wants to be seen as another white savior. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Uh, another question Bringer has is, why do you think we get to see the rest of what Tom goes through instead of follow Malone to the end? I think. We made it clear by showing it from Malone's point of view. I think, like, any reader who isn't black who reads this realizes, oh, mm, this is uncomfortable. For a purely narrative reason, though, I think it was a really wise decision because now we don't know what's happening with Tom, and that keeps us interested, right? Like, think about it. We cut to Malone. Malone, We're now seeing it from the outside, and we get to see, when we see Tom, we don't understand what he's gone through. We're not so close to, to Tom anymore, and I think that's important, too. Because now he's back, he's calling by Black Tom, his cadence has changed, and he's got these powers. He's got the ability to, when he uses music, to create portals. Like, I think it's a brilliant little narrative thing, and plus ties it back to, more back to the horror at Red Hook by having it suddenly be, have Malone as the focus. So there's a lot of good reasons for that. But I think the one I noticed most was that I think it helps keep the mystery to uh, what's happened with uh, Tommy Tester. Mm -hmm. Next question that he asked was, was Malone and Tom morally good in their choices or an end to justify the means? They're all monsters in the end. Even Tom admits that. But at least Tom has the wherewithal Mm -hmm. to realize what he's done. Yeah. For Tom, it was, he even says it. They, all they ever saw when they looked at me was a monster. So I was going to be the, the, just the damnest monster they have ever seen and he but he does seem to show some remorse in his actions though at the end when he's sitting in victorian society with buckeye again where he's like i'd forgotten this this you know here among people who didn't see me as a monster like why did i go out and and 
put my father at risk and whatnot, but he, he knows his actions can't be undone mm-hmm. now. Especially now, because it's only a matter of time before uh, Cthulhu does whatever it's going to do, now that it's awake. Let's not forget, there's a point where Malone says, you're a monster then, and he says, well, you made me this way. And it's true. Mm-hmm. It's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay. So this one actually is has to do with... Uh, Cosmic Horror. This is from Dovey. From, from Dovey does. By the way, I, I wanted. I told her I would yeah, give this a shout out. Uh, she's working on a mystery visual novel with dating elements called Other Demons A to Z. And uh, if you want to uh, look up more about this, check out her Twitter at at Dovey does. But anyway, I do wonder if any of you have thoughts on the concept that rather than cosmic indifference being inherently terrifying, as with Lovecraft that it actually can be a comfort, as is mentioned in Black Tom. Uh, now, I, before we delve into that, this actually got into a conversation on our Discord, which is amazing to see that people are talking. And I asked um, one of the people in our Discord if I could quote him, and this is from Zaf, and he says, I think there's a lot of beauty in cosmic indifference. Frankly, cosmic, uh, cosmicism? I'm hoping yeah, cosmicism. And racism don't really work together. If humanity at large does not matter, then what makes one person more better than any other? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's so well said. Mm-hmm. There is kind of a beauty to that where it's that idea, if the world doesn't matter, what does it matter what we do anyway? So Why you, the overwhelmingly petty squabbles for power are insignificant to just the fact that like I, I like that because it takes everything that's supposed to be horrific about what Lovecraft wanted to say like we don't matter we ultimately don't matter instead spins it's like cool that takes the pressure off yeah I it definitely I think it depends on the person on where where you fall on that I think in the in the same way some people see death in a similar way in that well I mean we're all gonna die so just you know live your life and be kind to each other and all the petty shit doesn't matter mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's kind of on that same vein. Um, Yeah, I think it's ultimately up to the person on on whether that cosmic indifference is is, is terrifying or just very relieving of everything. Um, I agree with certain things, but there's some things I disagree with, but I can see, again, the beauty behind feeling indifferent towards um, what happens, but at the same time, I prefer it is important to care about others. I, I'm more of a humanist than someone who thinks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, for... If we're gonna get a little personal about it, like, for me, it's more like, you know, live your you live your day-to-day, be kind to each other, you know, and, and just make the most of what you can, but don't fucking, like, take shit away from other people, yeah. you know? I totally, I totally get that. I think that the beauty comes from the recognition that if you don't do that, there's not, like, kind of the idea that, like, the, the what the Elder Gods represent is... Your, your actions don't matter to some higher power. Mm-hmm. There is none. Not in the face of things like Cthulhu or Dagon or Haster or any of the, the entities that exist out there. The, the, you know, whether they're the great old ones or something else entirely. It's just that, again, cosmic indifference. There's a beauty to the idea that, like, there's not. And I, I, I don't, I, again, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but I can see where that comes from. Uh, any last minute thoughts? If you, again, if you haven't read this, for some reason, read it. Please do. Yes, please. And I recommend the audiobook. Please listen to the audiobook. It's amazingly Any good. Any quick thoughts about what Ma'at might have been? Cause, or does, it, does that really matter? Because I really dug when the kind of slow reveal that she also probably wasn't human. Yeah, that was cool. Because again, like how you, you mentioned earlier, that was really cool that there's this otherworldliness that is just a a layer under the modern day. Like, that was really great. I I enjoyed that bit where uh, Malone was like trying... Was like freaking out that uh, Howard was like kicking the door and being fucking rude. And he's like, don't do that but he can't say anything and it, it's cool i love it the the what what victor lavelle did sorry i, I hit things when i'm excited. no it's good <laughs> um <laughs> was he definitely took something that lovecraft made and 100 percent made it his own he made it beautiful and and still dark and gritty and very fucking real when it is it has such fantastical elements at the same time anyway i fucking love the book like just everything good Please read it. 
Um, it's one of my favorite things I've read this year. Oh, absolutely. Like, this hands is, down. Yes. Both in and out of this podcast. So for our next read, knowing that we're still kind of in quarantine, and I, if you did read along with us, I really appreciate it. We've also decided that for the rest of the year, we are reading short stories, maybe some comics, and anything, just anything by authors that are of color. That is the goal for the rest of the year. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it's a way to, first of all, expand our reading set and to see from different points of views that aren't our own so and also the last book we did read by a person of color was probably one of our favorites which was five midnights Mm -hmm. um so i recommend that book too (laughs) so the next uh so we're gonna read a short story which you can read online for free and it's called the u train by nk jemison it's a very short story so it's a quick read but it sounds very fascinating and i Look forward to reading this. Uh, link will be down in the show notes. And we'll also uh, send it out on Twitter as well. Anything to plug? The Witching Hour is coming back sometime this month. I don't know when exactly, but I promise it's coming back. And then we also have the Boolympics. So the Creative Horror team will be doing a series of Halloween themed challenges um, up until Halloween. So each month we have a little contest and the within our little group we are teaming up into teams of two and competing against each other uh this month this first month for july we're doing a cooking contest we're all gonna cook something and some of us can't cook so that's gonna be fun but hey if you can cook you can also cook something cool and halloweeny and just as long as you email it to us by the 25th of uh this month of july then we will include it uh, alongside with what we make and we can all just have a good time because we're stuck inside anyway. Uh, but take care of yourselves. Wear your masks. Where can they send it to? I think I forgot to put up the email, but just send it to either the Midnight Marinara email, yeah. which David can tell you. MidnightMarinara at gmail.com. Or Jesse Reyes at creativehorror.com. Speaking of Midnight Marinara, come October 30th, if all goes well, for the seventh anniversary of Midnight Marinara, there will be a new episode of Midnight Marinara. But beyond that, we are slowly re-uploading the entire archive to YouTube now on the Creative Horror YouTube channel, as well as previous episodes of Undercooked Analysis. Uh, That show continues as normal, um, and um, I think that with the more, the the quicker uploading schedule, we'll be all caught up with that fairly soon, if all goes well. Uh, So be sure to check that out if you, uh, for some reason, don't want to go to Venue Network to listen to the older episodes of Midnight Marinara. They will be up on the YouTube channel. We've already got about 12 episodes up as of this recording, and there will be more, uh, there will be more coming very, very soon. All right, uh... Let's uh, blow out the candles and uh, make sure Cthulhu doesn't find us when we escape. Oh, I got a last little bit of blood here. So before you blow out the candles, let me just put that last boil letter of the Supreme Alphabet here, okay? Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinara, and this podcast is part of creativehorror.com a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at creativehorror.com. <laughs>